Hey everybody, this is Kevin Wallace, double CCA and Cisco Press author. And one of the terms we hear a lot in the Cisco networking world these days is IWAN. That's Cisco's Intelligent Wide Area Network. But what exactly is IWAN all about? That's what you're going to learn in this video. Stay tuned. A term that we hear a lot lately in the world of Cisco is IWAN, or Intelligent WAN. And I thought in this short video we would cover the basics of what IWAN is all about. What is this buzzword we keep hearing? Well, before we talk about the Intelligent WAN, let's just bring ourselves back up to speed with a classical WAN. We know that a WAN is a wide area network, and a wide area network is going to connect local area networks, or LANs, over fairly large geographical distances. Maybe we've got offices in different cities. Maybe we've got a direct connection between the branch office one, the BR1 side, and the HQ side. And another connection between uh, BR2 and uh, HQ. Those are WAN links. And we've got different technologies that we've used over the years to construct these WAN links. Some examples include having a leased line. Back in the day, it was commonplace to have a T1 between offices or an E1 in some other countries. And uh, these days, it's really easy to get an internet connection in a small office, home office. Maybe we've got a cable modem. Well, we could simply connect back to the headquarters securely by setting up a VPN over that very readily available internet connection. MPLS, that's another technology we have a lot these days. We can have VPNs established over these multi-protocol label switching networks. In uh, some large metropolitan areas, we might have the opportunity to connect into Metro E or Metro Ethernet, where we essentially are using Ethernet at very high speeds coming in to our offices. Some people might argue that that's more of a MAN or a Metropolitan Area Network technology as compared to a WAN, but I just wanted you to visualize how we're interconnecting some of these different offices. And I remember back in the day when I first started getting into networking, there was this thing that we call the 80-20 the rule, where we said that about 80% of your traffic stayed local inside of your network, while about 20% went off net. Well, these days it's sort of flip-flopped. It's sort of the 2080 rule these days because we've got a lot of traffic that's now leaving the local network. We've got increasing WAN demands. For example, Server virtualization has been super popular over the last few years. We can have one server with plenty of RAM and hard drive. We can have it act as the physical hardware for multiple virtual servers. We use something like VMware or vSphere, and we can have multiple virtual machines spin up on a single physical computer, a single physical server. And where we might have in the past had a server at a branch office site, now, that might be migrated to a data center that's at the headquarters because of virtualization. We can save a ton of money on hardware with server virtualization. Of course, we now have to go over the WAN to get to our server. And cloud-based services are becoming very, very popular. We have some of our resources out in the cloud these days. One thing that comes to mind is uh, Dropbox. I have a two terabyte Dropbox account. I think I've got about half a terabyte stored in it right now. but when I install a new computer and I want to synchronize it with my Dropbox account, that half a terabyte has to come down from the cloud, from the internet. Of course, we could have private cloud networks as well, but the idea is more and more traffic is leaving our local network and going out to the cloud. Nowadays, we're doing more and more voice over our network, and not just voice, but video as well. Cisco sort of combines those technologies into a suite of technologies that they refer to as collaboration. Also, people are bringing their own device, BYOD, bring your own device to work. People have their own smartphones, their tablets are connecting into our networks, and when they do that, that's gonna add some configuration complexity on our part because we might want to, for security purposes, keep those devices isolated from the production network while still letting those people on the network. And those people might be streaming Netflix to their iPad during their break, for example. These devices can start to eat up the way in bandwidth. Another administrative issue that we have is guest access at our remote offices. We want people to come in and get on the network while still securing them from our production network. But those guests, they might be using our WAN bandwidth as well. 
And also, quality of service is a huge deal when it comes to the wide area network. Quality of service can allow us to treat different types of traffic differently based on what type of traffic it is. We want to treat voice and video with very low latency, perhaps. We want to guarantee a certain amount of bandwidth for voice and video. Maybe file transfers have a lower priority. They don't get to go first, and maybe we limit how much bandwidth they can use. But on a local area network where maybe we have gig links, or in some cases 10 gig links between our switches, bandwidth is not that much of a concern. It's much more of a concern over the wide area network. That's where quality of service really shines. So when we have these WAN connections and we're adding on applications, we might need to go in and configure or reconfigure our quality of service policies. The WAN might also be used when some of these branch offices are trying to get out to the internet. Let's take a look at a couple of examples of how the branch offices could get out to the internet. One example we're going to call centralized internet access. This is where there's an internet connection from our main site, HQ in this case, going out to the internet. This means that if BR1 or BR2 want to get to the internet, you got it. They've got to go over the WAN link back to HQ to then get on the internet. Well, this certainly can reduce cost in terms of only having one internet connection for all three sites. They're all sharing the same connection. We've got less hardware. We've got less maintenance involved. But the downside is, you guessed it, we're using more WAN bandwidth when we do that because all this traffic has to come back to the HQ site over those WAN links. A different approach for getting these branch offices out to the internet, we're going to call distributed internet access. Here, we have a connection from each of our sites going directly out to the internet, and they can independently send traffic and receive traffic to and from the internet. This saves on WAN bandwidth between themselves and the HQ site. However, there's more expense involved in having additional internet connections. There's more expense involved in the extra administration and maintenance involved with those two additional internet connections. And now that we've reviewed the basics of what wide area networks are and some different ways of connecting wide area networks out to the internet, let's consider this acronym that we're hearing about a lot these days, the IWAN or the Intelligent WAN. And this is not going to be a super technical discussion. I just want to give you a feel for what IWAN is all about. It's got four foundational components. Cisco says that it's an architecture that can allow an enterprise to make more usable WAN bandwidth available at a lower cost, while keeping all the things we love about traditional WANs like good performance, security, reliability. And the first of the four components that Cisco identifies is transportation independence. This is a big deal. This means that we're not dependent on some underlying WAN technology. One office might be connecting in through a T1 lease line. Another office might be connecting uh, via cellular data, at least temporarily. For example, let's say that a new office is coming up and that new office is going to eventually get a Metro Ethernet connection. But in the meantime, maybe we have them using cellular data to get back to the headquarters. Well, IWAN gives us a layer of abstraction where we don't really care what the underlying technology is. And this is possible because IWAN is based on DM VPNs, Dynamic Multipoint Virtual Private Networks. In other words, we can bring up a virtual private network connection on demand on an as-needed basis, and we can use overlay routing which makes the routing protocols for using OSPF or EIGRP, those routing protocols can see next hop addresses as the endpoints of the VPN and not whatever the underlying technology might be using. So we're sort of shielding ourselves and shielding our routing protocols from having to know too much about the underlying WAN technology. Another core component of the intelligent WAN is intelligent path control. And here we can use something called a performance routing or PFR. Performance routing is able to monitor a class of traffic and see how that class of traffic is performing. And based on the type of traffic it is, we might have it use a particular WAN link, while maybe another type of traffic can use a different WAN link. As an example, let's say that we're doing voice over one DM VPN connection, but PFR decides that the file transfer isn't really high priority, so we're going to send it over a different DM VPN connection. So the bulk of all that file transfer data, it doesn't contend for bandwidth with our voice traffic. Another core component of IWAN is application optimization. 
Let me give you just one example of how IWAN can optimize the bandwidth used by applications. We can do some caching of repetitive data. Maybe in a data stream, there are certain strings, certain types of data that get sent repeatedly. Well, instead of sending those strings each and every time, taking up way and bandwidth in the process, if we can identify those repetitive strings, we can assign it sort of a signature. We can say that every time you see this pattern, every time you see this data string, replace it with this very, very short signature. And then we can tell the router at the other end of the link about that. And we just send the signature to the router at the other end. And it's got the actual string cached. So when it receives the signature, it knows to play out, as it's transmitting the data on the LAN, it knows to play out or transmit the actual original string, not the signature. That's a form of caching that's made possible when we use Cisco Wide Area Application Service, or WAAS, along with Akamai Connect. And of course, a big requirement for our wide area networks is security. We want to maintain secure connectivity. And of course, there's a lot we can do inside of our Cisco ISR routers. We can set up access control lists. Of course, ACLs are stateless. If I start a session using some protocol inside of my network, the return traffic may not be recognized as being part of that session when it comes back into the router, and it might not be allowed. So we can use stateful firewalls. We can use the Cisco IOS firewall to set up a stateful firewall right inside our Cisco IOS routers at these branch locations. We could even make it a bit more advanced. We could use Cisco's zone-based firewall on our routers where we define a set of interfaces as belonging to a security zone and giving a different level of permissions to those different zones. However, we also have the option of using Cisco Cloud Web Security, another acronym for you, CWS. What this can do is allow a branch office, if we're connected in that distributed internet access model where each branch site has a direct connection to the internet, if we're set up like that, the branch office router can send any outgoing HTTP or HTTPS traffic to a Cisco CWS data center that's closest to them, which is then going to scan that data looking for anything that might be suspect. It's going to scan it to make sure that it doesn't appear to be threatening, and then it can be transmitted on its way to its destination. But we can have this external service, this Cisco CWS service, scan our outgoing data for us. And that's an overview of what the Cisco Intelligent WAN can do. But there is another term that comes up a lot in this discussion, and I want you to be familiar with this term. It is the software-defined WAN. You may be familiar with SDN, Software Defined Networking, where we can have routers and switches and firewalls and other devices that get controlled by a controller. And then we can have applications that speak to the controller about how we want our devices configured and the controller can push out instructions to the routers and switches and other network gear to say, here's how we're updating all of your configurations. It's a way to maintain a consistent configuration on lots of networking devices really helpful for a large network. It's going to reduce error as well. Well, the software-defined WAN, or the SD-WAN, is where software-defined networking, or SDN, meets the wide area network. What we're doing is we're combining SDN technologies, where we have a controller that can speak to lots of devices. We're combining SDN technologies with IWAN technologies that we've talked about. This is going to allow us to have all those things like transportation independence, intelligent path control, application optimization, and maintain security and push out security policies to multiple branch office routers. This is going to allow us to administer large WAN deployments by combining IWAN with SDN technologies, and that's called SD-WAN. And in this video, I just wanted to give you the high-level overview of IWAN. That term shows up a lot today if you're reading through different blogs, and I wanted you to be familiar with what that's all about. If you want to get more into the technical details of Cisco IWAN, there's a great book, and I use this book as a reference for preparing much of this video, and it's the Cisco Intelligent WAN book from Cisco Press. It's a great book, and I highly recommend it. And you can purchase your copy by going to kwtrain.com slash iwanbook. That's kwtrain.com slash iwanbook. If you want to learn even more about Cisco routing and switching technologies, just click the link in the description or on the right side of the screen, and I'll send you more training videos. And also, if you don't want to miss any of my YouTube videos, be sure and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.